the academic mafia, the corruption of science and the forces behind it by Malcolm Bowden. Preliminary note. The narrative is reproduced on the screen and is continuous. The viewer may like to have his finger on the pause button to examine charts and graphs, etc. I began making this video with the intention of providing further support for geocentrism by examining the results of the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB, and the consternation they caused in the scientific world when they realized that they pointed to the planetary system and the Earth as being at least in a special position in the cosmos. I then quoted the work of Varshney, who found that quasars were also in specific bands of redshifts which placed the Earth at their center. This also caused concern in its day, and a paper by Stevenson, critical of his findings, was produced but was found to have two serious faults. Now Stevenson's rebuttal was found to have two major errors. I then remembered that I had met this sequence of events before. Rebuttal articles with two serious errors. In a paper refuting Barry Setterfield's claim that the speed of light had decreased, Goldstein recalculated Roma's 1675 data that Setterfield had used and concluded that the speed of light had hardly varied at all. The paper was quoted by opponents as making a full refutation of Setterfield's work. However, Mammal examined Goldstein's workings carefully and found two serious errors. Goldstein had one adjusted the time instead of the phases of Io, a moon of Jupiter used by Roma for his timings, and two, he had subtracted the observed times from the calculated when he should have subtracted the calculated from the observed. When these two errors were corrected, the actual results were a massive 6% plus or minus 8.6% above the present speed of light. Now I had long known that the top echelons of the scientific establishment I prefer to call them the scientific mafia as being more accurate were completely corrupted. I knew that they fiercely defended the sacred cows of their godless pet theories such as evolution, the big bang, relativity, heliocentricity the fabrication of ape men and many others. They were equally determined to ensure that nothing that supported the Christian biblical viewpoint would be allowed to be published in any of the many scientific journals, all of which are completely controlled by them. As I reviewed the situation, I decided to change the emphasis of the video and gave it the title you have just read. I will give the CMB and the Quasar evidence as I originally intended and then I will add a few more instances of corruption of the objective pursuit of science by the scientific mafia. Knowing that they are only a small part of a much larger international subversive movement, I felt that I should present this evidence to the viewer of what is really happening behind the scenes in the world of international controlling and subversive movements. Before we look at these two subjects, I must explain that there are two principles that are the bedrock on which modern cosmologists based all their thinking. The cosmological principle, the universe is homogeneous, the same everywhere, like creamy custard, and isotropic, we see the same wherever we look. If we saw differences in some places, then it would be anisotropic. This is closely connected to the Copernican principle. There is no special position for an observer in the universe. This means that we cannot claim that the Earth has a special position at the center of the universe. 
the atheist and humanist Carl Sagan claimed, Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Reviewing the rise of Copernicus's heliocentric views, the Encyclopedia Britannica gave a thinly disguised threat. The lesson learned by future scientists is that if a theory requires a special origin or viewpoint, then it is not plausible. I, any evidence that contradicts the Copernican principle must be ruled out of consideration by any scientist who values his status and income. So let us look at two subjects that do just that and how they were received. The Cosmic Microwave Background Scientists have found that all around the sky they record a very low temperature of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Absolute zero is the temperature that you cannot go below, 0 degrees Kelvin, and it is minus 273.16 Celsius, which is minus 459.7 Fahrenheit. Cosmologists immediately claimed that this 2.7 Kelvin was the faint echo of the Big Bang as it cooled down from its very hot starting temperature. In order to explore this feature, they sent up a satellite, COBE, that is Cosmic Background Explorer, in 1989. This surveyed the temperature for the whole sky and found there were very tiny variations, only about 50 millionths of a degree above and below the average temperature of 2.71 Kelvin. Now we can plot the whole of the Earth's surface on one map, like this. The maps of all these temperature variations for the whole sky are similarly plotted on a flat oval area. This is one of several plots of the raw data of the cosmic microwave background, called CMB, for the whole sky, similarly, on one map. The actual variations of the temperatures were then analysed mathematically to see if the temperature variations had any pattern of hotter or colder areas. When they looked at the results from Kobe, to their astonishment, they found that the results were not random, but produced a distinct pattern. When classified into hotter and colder areas, they were divided almost perfectly above and below the line of the ecliptic that is traced out by the sun's path through the sky. We give this diagram of the ecliptic from a geocentric view. You can see that the grey disk of the ecliptic path is at 23.4 degrees angle to our equator. To find that there was a pattern of temperatures in the heavens and that it was related to the path of the ecliptic badly shook orthodox cosmologists because it completely contradicted both of their fundamental cosmological and Copernican principles in one blow. Here was clear evidence that the universe was not random and the CMB patterns were related to the position of our tiny Earth and the solar system. Recognising its importance and the very disturbing implications it had, the two scientists researching the results, Kate Land and Jao Maguejo called it the axis of evil. Now why should they call the pattern they found evil? It is only evil to those who feel threatened by this discovery. 
It showed that the pattern of these small temperature differences had a very direct relationship to our Earth and the Sun's circuit around us, where there should be only randomness. If there was a relationship between this huge cosmic pattern and our tiny Earth, then both their fundamental theories of the cosmological and Copernican principles would be destroyed. They were facing the fact that the Earth was in a very special position in this vast cosmos. Having trained generations of astronomers to accept that this Earth was just a random accident in this impersonal universe, no wonder they were worried. In order to check these results, they sent another satellite into space. WMAP, Wilkinson's Microwave Anisotropy Probe, in 2001, that was more sensitive, but again they got the same pattern confirmed more clearly this time. In desperation, a third satellite was sent up. Planck, in 2009, by the European Space Agency. This was even more sensitive and scanned the heavens in a different way. But the pattern was obstinately still there. Realising the implications of these results, the scientists became less willing to produce maps that clearly showed this axis of evil. One such production altered the map by viewing the same variations from the position of the Milky Way, the galaxy that we are in. In this, the relationship between the results and the line of the ecliptic is far less obvious, but it is still there. Now how did the scientific establishment handle this explosive information? It is interesting to see how they wriggled like a worm caught on a hook. I give some examples. 1. The European Space Agency commenting on the Planck data. One of the most surprising findings is that the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave back radiation CMB temperatures at large angular scales do not match those predicted by the standard model. The standard model they referred to is the Big Bang model they have promoted for generations and the resulting cosmological and Copernican principles. They omit the more interesting fact that they are divided by the line of the ecliptic. The European Space Agency. Overall, the information extracted from Planck's new map provides an excellent confirmation of the standard model of cosmology at an unprecedented accuracy, setting a new benchmark in our manifest of the contents of the universe. But because precision of Planck's map is so high, it also made it possible to reveal some peculiar unexplained features that may well require new physics to be understood. Note how they are trying to say the results confirm their present views and minimise the threat that they really are to their foundational beliefs. They are actually lying because the important unexplained features were not revealed by Planck's greater accuracy, but had been known for 20 years, ever since the very first satellite, COBE, was sent up in 1989. The New Scientist, September 2009. Having offered some weak possibilities of instrumental errors or nearby galaxies distorting the radiation, it concludes... The European Space Agency's recently launched Planck Space Telescope might settle the issue when it makes the most sensitive maps yet of the CMB. Until then, the axis of evil continues to terrorise us. Their admission that it terrorised them 
is surely very revealing. In fact, Planck only confirmed the previous patterns. Cosmologists just do not know how to handle these troublesome results, so they simply fudge the whole issue. Many more statements like these could be quoted. It is clear that under no circumstances will the scientists ever admit that these results blow their leaky cosmological vessels right out of the water. Strangely, one of the original discoverers of the evidence, Magrejo, did say, another way to create a preferred direction would be to have a rotating universe, because this singles out the axis of rotation as different from all other directions. Geocentrists do claim that it is the daily revolution of the stars around the Earth that gives rise to the effects that we see today. The Foucault pendulum, oblateness of the Earth, Coriolis forces, etc. But why should scientists be so terrified of these CMB results? Surely they are only interested in finding the facts of a situation and reporting them honestly to the public. Before we look at how the scientific world really works, let us examine another subject that caused concern to the scientific establishment. Varshni and quasars. Quasars or quasi-stellar radio sources have very high redshift and are therefore considered to be the most distant objects visible. They are also the brightest objects in the universe generating colossal amounts of electromagnetic energy that cover the whole spectrum. How they generate all this energy is not really known, but it has been proposed that they are a massive black hole in the centre of galaxies. There are some 200,000 known quasars. Title, The Redshift Hypothesis for Quasars. Is the Earth the centre of the universe? By Varshni, YP. In this article, Varshni studied 384 quasars and classed them in 57 groups that had similar spectra. He then found that those in any one group with similar spectra also had very similar redshifts. This placed the Earth at the centre of these 57 shells with an average of 7 quasars in each shell. In his challenging article, Varshni examined two possible explanations, but dismissed them as not complying with the evidence. In his third possible explanation, he said, The Earth is indeed the centre of the universe. The arrangement of quasars on certain spherical shells is only with respect to the Earth. These shells would disappear if viewed from another galaxy or a quasar. This means that the cosmological principle will have to go. Also, it implies that a coordinate system fixed to the Earth will be a preferred frame of reference in the universe. Consequently, both the special and the general theory of relativity must be abandoned for cosmological purposes. Varshni said the arrangement of quasars in spherical shells is only with respect to the Earth. These shells would disappear if viewed from another galaxy or quasar. You can see that if each shell had the same redshift, then the Earth would be at the centre of each shell. However, if the Earth were anywhere else than in the centre of the shells, the distance to the quasars would all be very different. Here indeed was a challenge to the establishment cosmologists. The reply was swift. Stevenson, in a paper in 1977, claimed that Varshni's statistical analysis was incorrect. 
Varshney replied to this in 1977 and showed that Stevenson's analysis was not only incorrect but also contained an arithmetic error. He said, he proposes two tests, both of which are reasonable to check this point. However, his results and conclusions are erroneous because he has used incorrect delta Z in his calculations and has also made an arithmetical error. We show in this note that when the correct delta Z is used, the essential conclusions of paper one are substantiated. Varshney's evidence was also investigated by a team who examined many more quasars, but they only confirmed Varshney's findings. A rumour was put around that he had recanted, but this he strongly denied. So Varshney's claim that the Earth is at the centre of the quasar shells still stands. As I have said, I knew how the academic mafia operated and suppressed evidence that contradicted any of the important subjects that they promoted vigorously. Evolution, relativity, Big Bang, etc. Here we can see how the system swung into operation when threatened by these two pieces of contradictory evidence. Setterfield's CDK and Varshney's quasars against their cosmological and Copernican principles. Their rejection of unwanted evidence is by means of their control of the mass media. In particular, the system known as peer review by journals where any article is subjected to criticism and judgment by fellow specialists in their field to eliminate bad articles unsupported by good scientific evidence. The peer review system. Considering these two cases of simple errors in peer review articles, both critical of evidence that supported the creation view, there is a very important point that should be considered by the viewer of this video. We have noted that evidence for creation is never published in peer-reviewed science journals, being rejected as inadequately supported by the evidence, contrary to present views, etc., etc. Yet, here we have two papers that were published in the peer-reviewed journals, yet they both contained two serious errors. How did they get past their reviewers? Obviously, it required only a word from a high-ranking scientist I deliberately put the inverted commas in to a fellow Mafia colleague editor of a scientific journal to publish such a paper without giving it peer review which ought to have picked up these errors. This proves the point that others have claimed that have had also papers rejected that the peer review system is not to prevent the publication of spurious articles using false or inadequate evidence but the peer review system is there to prevent the publication of any papers that contradict the present orthodox views of the atheist scientific mafia. This would include such subjects as creation, geocentricity, the decrease in the speed of light, the fictitious ape men, missing links, etc. The question is then, how do they operate such a system and keep it secret from the general public, presenting themselves as objective seekers after the truth, free of personal influence? The answer is very simple. Scientific American surveyed high-level scientists and found that about 90% of them were atheists. With such a predominance of opposition, it is little wonder that those in high positions who believe that there is a God 
keep very quiet about it. The atheists and humanists control every single scientific publication. So any article, whether from a Christian or non-Christian, that is critical of evolution, cosmology, Big Bang, etc., is rarely published. Then our critics turn round and say to creationists, Your evidence is so poor that it never appears in a peer-reviewed journal. So we have two examples where articles were well researched and published but were supportive of the Bible's view of the world. Varshney's Quasars and Setterfield's CDK. They were both criticised by a dismissive article but both were found to have two fundamental flaws in them that should have been spotted by a peer reviewer but they were not. Indeed it is likely that they were never peer reviewed but rapidly published to quickly denigrate the claims of the original articles. Indeed it could be said that they had to have flaws because they were criticising articles that were true in their data, outworkings and conclusions. These reply papers must have been approved for publication at a very high level to have avoided the peer review system and yet still be published. I will be showing how the atheists and anti-Christians gained control of all the major scientific institutions. With such control it is easy to see how it takes only a few people at the top of the science world to ensure that they were published despite their flaws. They had to have some rebuttal of these dangerous articles that not only threatened their house of cards but also supported the Bible. These are only two examples I quote but there are many other instances and letters in journals that convince me that I'm right to call the people behind such activities the scientific mafia. With this total blockage we can see why. With such powers of censoring unwelcome evidence the public will be well sheltered from every article that is critical of the godless atheistic scenario regularly presented about our truly wonderful universe that could only have been created. Every article that I have seen in the mass media that refers to some aspect of biblical truth always contains a comment by a critic who claims it is totally unscientific and then proceeds to ridicule it. I would ask the viewer how many articles have you ever read in the mass media, TV, newspapers, journals etc. that is an honest report of some article or event that puts Christianity and or the Bible in a good light. Clearly they are all totally controlled by anti-Christian atheists in position of high authority. I will begin by looking at two major conspiracies that changed the direction of science in the United Kingdom. Firstly, the takeover of the Royal Society and secondly, the X Club. The Royal Society, its Puritan foundation. Historians of the development of science have noted that the discipline of science could only arise within the influence of the Christian faith. All other faiths have an element of fickleness in their gods. British Puritan Christians realised that God was not fickle and had made laws that governed the working of the universe. Accordingly, they set out to discover what they were and then to use them for the benefit of mankind in general. A group of Puritans met in 1645 and they were the core of the later Royal Society founded in 1660. 
Of its 68 signatories, 42 were Puritans. Anti-Christian viewers of this video might like to meditate on the fact that there would be no science but for the Christian faith. Out of it rose the British Industrial Revolution that ultimately improved the lives of billions around the world. Realising the important role the Royal Society would play in the future of the nation, it was deliberately targeted by anti-Christian forces. Their technique was to laugh loudly if a speaker mentioned God or referred to the Christian faith. In the 1720s, a so-called infidel club led by Martin Folks, a prominent Freemason, says Wikipedia, arose in the Royal Society and he was elected president in 1741. By 1778 the takeover was complete. Now note, not only the method used, ridicule, it's still used today, but also the time that the takeover took, 1660 to 1778, 118 years. This gives some indication of the long-term aims of these people, aims that can stretch over several generations, in dogged pursuit of complete control over a nation's affairs, all carried out by hidden subversion. See my book, The Rise of the Evolution Fraud. Details are on my website. A recent exposure of the Royal Society's anti-Christian bias. In September 2008, the Reverend Professor Rice, Director of Education at the Royal Society, suggested that science teachers should not ridicule pupils who believed in creation, but patiently provide evidence against it. He was immediately accused of wanting to teach creation in science lessons and within days was forced out of his position. Even some Royal Society members and the national press said that it brought shame upon the society. With this hysterical reaction, evolutionists have no right to call creationists narrow-minded bigots. So this once great society, originally founded on Christian principles, has now completely destroyed the ethics of its foundations, giving a clear indication of the direction it is intent on pursuing. The powerful but secretive X Club. Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859, and in 1864, Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, formed the secretive and very powerful X Club. This was nine very influential senior scientists who held high office in the Royal Society, the Geological Society, British Association, Linnaean Society, etc. They met just before the meetings of the Royal Society, already under their control, and planned events in their periodical war with religion. In the newly arising universities, they ensured that all senior posts were taken by fellow evolutionists and they dominated the whole of the British scientific establishment for nearly 30 years. See my book, The Rise of the Evolution Fraud. It does not take much imagination to see just how they could manipulate the whole direction of science in this country. Today, every university is totally committed to teaching evolution and any attempts to introduce evidence for creation is fiercely ridiculed and dismissed. These are just two examples of how Christian-based organisations and institutions have been seized by malicious forces. But what is their effect on people? Let me give some examples. One. 
One of the best surveys of the persecution of creationists is by Jerry Bergman. His article can be read at the following uh, URL. I give a few quotes. Hardy believers in creation have been heaped with scorn and ridicule. Evolutionists dominated the field so securely that creationists were fired, denied tenure and denied advanced degrees with impunity in public schools and universities. Quote, Anyone holding the creationist viewpoint must be illogical, backward, subversive, uneducated and stubborn. Quote, Creationists are stupid, lying people who are not to be trusted in any way and that all their points are equally stupid except where the creationists are outrightly lying. That was by Isaac Asimov. The article is about the American scene, but it is just the same in the UK. Just a few examples from America. Halton Arp found wisps of material between many quasars that had large redshifts and galaxies that had much smaller redshifts. This showed that redshift was not a measure of distance, the bedrock of cosmologists. Photos showing these wisps were cropped to omit them. He was denied telescope time, the use of X-ray photos. His papers were refused publication, etc. He eventually went to the Planck Institute in Germany. See my YouTube video, The Big Bang Fraud. Professor Mark Armitage had written many articles in Science magazine. He wrote one about soft tissue he had found in the horn of a Triceratops dinosaur and merely said, this needs to be investigated further. We have a lot of work to do. For this, he was dismissed from California State University, Northridge. Pacific Justice, a non-profit organization dedicated to defending liberty and religious freedom, took his case to court and won. Dr. Mary Schweitzer also found soft tissue in a dinosaur bone. She received heavy and dismissive criticism. And in Britain, Louise Essen. Essen was a highly respected scientist who was the inventor and developer of the cesium clock. His obituary in the Daily Telegraph on the 5th of September 1997 referred to his stubborn resistance to relativity and then said, Essen put forward his criticisms so vehemently that he came to be regarded as an anti-establishment troublemaker. He was even warned that his promotion prospects and thus his pension might be affected if he did not desist. And who says that there is no academic mafia? Some examples from the UK. Mr. Andrew Luce, MSc. His chosen dissertation was on the age of the earth. He found it was very speculative and had to conform to the evolutionary time scale. His paper was the only one attended by the professor of the department. Shortly afterwards, an order was issued that the subject of future dissertations must be discussed with their tutor first. Thus, controversial subjects would be avoided. For about eight years, I regularly spoke to about 120 sixth form pupils at each of the two top grammar schools in my area. They were so fascinated by what I said at the boys' school that they regularly took me into an unused classroom and hammered me with questions for a further 45 minutes. At the girls' school, they took me into their common room with teachers also attending. All were greatly interested. Suddenly, about 2010, I received no invite from both schools. I later learned 
that the Humanist Association had approached the government to ban creationists from all schools. We begin to see just how deeply laid and long-term are the plans of the anti-Christian forces that today have control of all organisations that have power and patronage. They have been taken over by secret societies whose members help one another into prime positions of power, sinecures, inflated incomes, golden handshakes and large indexed pensions. The Corruption in Modern Life Many are beginning to realise that virtually every institution that controls our life is now totally corrupt. You have only to read the newspapers to see this. Serious scandals in banking, politics, business, local government, medicine, police, etc. fill the newspapers daily. Charities started by Christians and voluntary organisations have also been taken over as can be seen by the changes they make and the elimination of any Christian ethos they once had. The two main UK churches have serious internal problems with doctrines and practices contrary to the Bible whilst other once large churches are declining rapidly. Attempts to increase numbers by making services more attractive are found not to work. So the nation becomes increasingly godless, just as intended by these corrupting forces. So widespread is this decline that many contend that it is the outworkings of a much deeper conspiracy aiming at world domination. Who are these people and what are their organisations? The secret subversive movements behind the international corruption. The main body considered to control many other organisations is the Illuminati. This was founded in 1776 in Bavaria by Professor Adam Weishaupt. The whole conspiracy was exposed in 1786 when a messenger taking letters from one conspirator to another was killed en route. The government opened the letters he was carrying and realised that they had uncovered a conspiracy against their nation as well as others. It was so appalling that they invited the governments of other nations to come and examine these original documents. They questioned Weishaupt, who tried to defend his actions. It was said to have been disbanded in 1786, but they simply regrouped and continued with their secret aims. They coordinated other clandestine groups and also used them as recruiting grounds, particularly Freemasonry. But what were their aims? The aims of the Illuminati. In one of her books, Nesta Webster gives the main aims of the Illuminati, which are 1. Abolition of monarchy and all ordered government. 2. Abolition of private property and of inheritance. 3. Abolition of patriotism. 4. Abolition of the family, i.e. of marriage and all morality and the institution of the communal education of children and five, abolition of all religion. She contends that these aims were incorporated into all subsequent rebellious movements e.g. the Haute Vente Romaine, the Alliance Sociale Démocratique, the writings of the Bolsheviks, Regarding the similarly worded protocols, Webster contends they were forged by the Illuminati to discredit the Jews. Their origin is shrouded in mystery. All these subversive movements base their aims on those of the overarching Illuminati. We have only to look around today to see whether or not these aims 
are being covertly imposed on the life of ordinary people. Every single one of these subversive organisations present a front of promising a perfect government using deceptive slogans such as Workers of the World Unite You Have Nothing to Lose But Your Chains and Liberty, Equality and Fraternity The result is quite the opposite They regularly promise a new beginning under a new leader who always is worse than his predecessor Their real aim is still the enslavement of the people as the communists did to the whole of Russia when they gained control by terrorising the population. When the first revolution arose in Russia, a sealed train went through the German and Russian lines who were supposed to be at war, full of revolutionary Bolsheviks who terrorised the people while they took over the nation. Many, particularly young students, are fooled by their slogans and willingly serve the cause of revolution to bring about equality and eradicate poverty. Lenin called them useful idiots. In his books Animal Farm and particularly his 1984 George Orwell foresaw that there would be three classes. One, the elite who controlled the nations. Two, the apparatchiks who were well paid to enforce the commands of the elite. Three, the proles who were kept in a near state of destitute slavery. Exactly the situation in communist Russia. Wars between the three great powers were fabricated to keep the proles subjected to privation and hard work. On that subject, it has been admitted that the Tonkin Bay incident of a Vietnamese ship firing on an American warship that was used to trigger the Vietnam War never actually took place. All the civilised nations are approaching the situation outlined by Orwell with increasing rapidity and the general public are quite unaware of it all happening. The Roman senators in their day prevented the people from rioting by distracting them with bread and circuses, cheap food and entertainment. Today's equivalent is sex and football. We have had one hint of what would happen if the banking system were to totally collapse with the subprime mortgage scam spearheaded by the lawyer Barack Obama that led to the banking crisis of 2008. The bank's leverage of nine system means they are lending nine times the money that is deposited with them by the public. They are lending money that they have not got. It is a fragile house of cards that will probably be the first to collapse with just one puff of wind. Meanwhile, the small evangelical church continues to quietly spread the gospel of God's love for all. The godless powers of the day know that it is the real enemy because it will not bow down to the godless worldly ethos being forced upon it. Evangelicals maintain their love for God and suffering mankind because God has placed his Holy Spirit within each one of them. This comparatively small group is therefore the subject of vicious persecution, overt and covert, on every continent by the corrupt forces around them. So in this video we have come a long way from erroneous articles criticising CDK and Varshni's quasars that bypass peer reviews to the academic mafia intent upon preserving their false theories of evolution 
Big Bang, Relativity and Heliocentrism. To the powerful organisations that propagate these anti-Christian views, yet maintain a front of honest inquiry by controlling the mass media. I then showed very briefly, and I could add much more evidence, that the academic mafia are only one part of a much larger collection of deeply subversive international organisations whose aim is the total control of all nations. I fully realise that this will generate huge ridicule from those useful idiots that oppose such views, for they are all well aware that if such views as I have expressed are an accurate reflection of what is really happening in the world today, then they know that they are ultimately on the losing side. Hence their rage and anger when they are presented with the evidence that this universe has been created and that one day they will have to answer to the God who created it. In all of this, what is the position of the true Christian? That is, those who accept the Bible as God's accurate and perfect word for his people's instruction, comfort and guidance. In it, the Christian has been warned of the coming world chaos. So he has been well forewarned of what to expect. He can still have a deep peace within his heart despite the dark future because he has had the Spirit of God placed there by God himself. He should therefore be well prepared for all that this sorrowful, sin-sick world can throw at him because he knows that his final resting place is with a loving God. I will leave the viewer to meditate on a short couplet I have made to emphasize an important principle I live by. We live on this earth three score years and ten, but eternity lasts forever. Which is the more important? I trust you found that interesting. Thank you for listening.